So, hey, we've been on this series on, on discipleship, discipleship. So, um, last week we, dis- we were in uh, John chapter 2 and we're finishing up John chapter 2 today. Uh, last week we talked about Jesus turning water into wine in the city of Cana. And his mother telling him that they were out of wine and, and, uh, and Jesus letting her know, listen, it's not my time to do any miracles. And she, she basically ignored him and uh, gave him the, the, the people that were around him instruction to do whatever Jesus told them to do. And we've seen Jesus really actually start his first miracle. Who would ever think the son of God would, would actually have a very first miracle of actually turning water into wine and and, and, and so much that the people that knew something about wine, I ain't saying it's winos, but, you know, somebody knew a little something, something about wine said you 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 left the good stuff to last. Right. So it wasn't that Jesus made like a non-alcoholic version of wine. He he's going to make wine. He, he made the best wine. And so this week we're going to continue on with the study in John chapter two. We're going to look at verse 12 where we'll be talking about the two things, the temple and the Passover. Everybody say the temple and the Passover. So we'll look at those things and look at the promises that are associated with both of those things. For So Jesus, he starts off here and his first like he's going to the temple. I would imagine lots and lots of times. But on this occasion, he comes to the temple. and He begins to do some work. So in John chapter two, verse 12, we find these words written. It says after that, he went down to Capernaum. So last week he was in Cana. They just crisscross across. I don't know how many miles it is, probably 30, 40 miles on foot. And uh, maybe they had some donkeys or something, but Jesus and his disciples got around. So now they're over at Capernaum. It says his mother went with him and his brothers and his disciples. And it says they did not stay there many days. So it's like God said, listen, something's going to happen in Capernaum. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Not today. We're going to move on. Jesus is going on now from Capernaum up to Jerusalem. So he, he goes to Jerusalem. And he's going into Jerusalem and he's going when they're celebrating the Passover. And what we first thing that we want to know, if you have notes and you're taking notes, is that God desires personal relationship. God desires personal relationship over church business. God desires personal relationship over church business. So, Pastor Bobby, what are you what are you talking about? Well, let's look at the scriptures and see what happens here. So in John chapter two, verse 13 It says, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. It says, and Jesus went, went up to Jerusalem. And it says that he found in the temple, everybody say in the temple. He found in the temple those who sold oxen or cattle and sheep and doves and money changers doing business in the temple. So this is kind of funny that he said, I'm coming to God's house, but I got people that's basically started a stockyard, not outside the temple, but in the, they started a stockyard. That ain't a good thing. So Jesus, he walks into the temple and he, he's stepping over cow manure and them little bitty uh, sheep pellets that they dispense. And he's got, he's got doves flying at his head and he's ducking and bobbing and weaving through all this chaos that's going on in the temple. But I love the fact that the first time the word temple is mentioned is actually all the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 2 with this lady named Hannah. She's married and the Bible says that, that she, got a, she goes to the temple because she got a problem that she, uh, she's, a, she's in a polygamy type situation where her husband's got another wife and other wife. Penina, she's got sons and daughters and and, and, and here it is, Hannah, she's trying to have babies to make herself equivalent to this other wife, and she can't have any children. And so she, she goes, and they, they come to the temple and says that she comes over, and she's on her knees in the temple, and she's crying out to God, saying, listen, God, listen, if you will bless me to have a son, my commitment to you is that I'm going to bring that son back to this temple and I'm going to lend him to you. And in all the days of his life, he's going to serve you in this temple. And says the Bible says that there was a guy named Eli who was a priest in the temple. And Eli, he comes up and he sees her here at the altar. And she ain't, she, he can see her lips moving, but she, she, he don't hear any words coming out. And she, he accuses her of being drunk in the temple. And, and what his problem was is he approaches her and he begins to fuss at her and say, woman, why are you coming in here drunk in the temple? And she says, listen, I, I got a deep hurt. My heart is breaking because I don't have a child and 
I'm, I'm believing God. He's going to bless me with a son. And Eli said, listen, I want you to go and let it be unto you as you said. But what God was really doing with her that she didn't know is this book, 1 Samuel, is written after the child that he gave her, Samuel, who would become a priest. Because this guy, Eli, he had sons that served in God's house. They were doing business in God's house, but they had no relationship with God. As a matter of fact, the Bible said that they didn't know anything about God. They knew not God is what it says about the sons of Eli. And it says that they would have sex with women in the temple. They would make deals with people who were coming to offer God sacrifices outside the church building for their own enrichment. And it says that this woman, she came, she didn't know it, but in verse 35 in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35, we find these words. I love it. It says that, I've never done this before. This is new for me right there. 1 Samuel 1, verse 35, it says, I will raise up for myself, this is God speaking, a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart. This is God speaking. And it says, and what's going to do what's according into my heart and my mind? And it says, I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed one always. And I believe that what the scripture that's found over when Hannah was praying was mentioning was this very act that we see right here that's happening with Jesus in the temple. Now Jesus, he comes in the temple. He's got a similar situation with Eli was running. How in the world can you be in God's house and you got a livestock yard running right through the church? And he says that the priests wasn't doing what they're supposed to do. So Jesus, he takes it upon himself. Look at verse 15. It says, and Jesus made a whip. Anybody know what a whip is? Any whipologists in the room? Anybody? No, he made a whip. And it says when I was growing up in Oklahoma, it says that I, I would I would go to the Stark yard. We had we you know we 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 don't have these big tractors and stuff like y'all have here in northeastern Oklahoma. Like I was mesmerized when I came to Salisbury and I seen the tractor tires like like as tall as the ceiling. I I call them say, man, they got the biggest tractors I ever seen in my life. This is a this is amazing. Oh look, you know I'm taking pictures of, and then one of the guys say, hey, you want to come out? I'm gonna put you on the combine. Oh, baby, I was in heaven. You know, I was like, how in the world does a corn ear of corn come off and take every individual ear of corn off the kernel, off the cob and spit the cob out one way and keep the cob? I want to see that. Like I was in heaven, but my, in Oklahoma, we had cattle and horses and, and, and you go to the stockyard and I don't care how big the bull was. When a person got in there in the, in the pen with him to move him on down into the room where they're going to bid on him, baby, he got in there with the, what we would call the bull whip was about five foot long and it had not about five or six inch tail. He just started snapping it. Guess what? The bull would get the, he'd get the bull's attention. Even though he had big horns, baby, he was trying to find an exit to move on because the person with the bull whip was in control. So, so Jesus, he, he, he walks in the temple. And he didn't have a bull whip, but baby, he said he, he picked up some stuff and found some right things. He began to drive them out of the temple with, with, with the sheep and the oxen. He said, Jesus, when he poured out the changes of the money and overturned tables, like what in the world's really going on here? Like Jesus is out having a good day in the temple. Would you say so? Right. He it's not like he hadn't been in a temple before. But what's happened is now Jesus's situation is turned. Now he's moved from being an ordinary citizen. Now he's taken on this priestly mantle at age 30. He's called his disciples. And now when he's coming in a temple, he's coming in with a new vision, a new dream, a new purpose. He's coming to establish order in God's house. And it says because the priest wasn't doing their job. He's letting people come into church and set up a local business and profit off of God's house and Jesus began to pour out the money and flip over tables and stuff and whacking people with the bull whip. That ain't real nice. <laughs> Jesus coming there, he, he getting things in order. Next thing it says, he says, the God's house, God's house, if you're taking notes, God's desire, God's desire is that a, a house of prayer, not a house of merchandise. God desires a house of prayer and not a house of merchandise. And it goes on to say here in John chapter 2, verse 16, he says, and he said unto those who sold doves, this is Jesus speaking, says, take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Do not make my father's house a house, house of merchandise. Verse 17 says, and his disciples remember that it was, as was written that the zeal of 
your house has, uh, has eaten me up. So Jesus had a righteous indignation about him. So God, God, through Jesus, is basically saying that he wanted his house to be a house of prayer, not a house of merchandise. And we see the first mention of that is over in Isaiah chapter 56 and really verse 4 and 5 teach us about these these men called eunuchs. And God says, if a eunuch would want to come and serve me, a eunuch is a person, a male um, individual who has um, been fixed. We would call that for male dogs. What does it call when you fix the male dog? Spayed or neutered? Neutered. So there you go. Get a visual. So these are eunuchs. In uh, verse 4 and 5, it says that uh, if a eunuch will come unto me, um, and he was going to join himself to me in my house. I am going to make his name as an everlasting name. Even though he doesn't have son and daughters, I'm going to give him a name that's going to be even greater than what he could experience by bearing children of his own. And then it goes on to say here in verse 6, that's 4, four and 5 on eunuchs. Verse 6 and 7, Jesus, uh, the God is telling us what God, Jesus really the father is giving to us what he really desires for his house. He says, uh, if us also the sons of a foreigner who join themselves to the Lord, who serve him, who love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, to everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast to my covenant. He's like, you're in. All I want you to do is join yourself to me, serve me, love my name. It says when you do that and you become my servants, you keep my Sabbath and you hold fast to my word. He says, I'm going to give you something. This is what I desire for you. Verse 7 of, of Isaiah 56 he says, even I will bring you to my holy mountain. I'll bring you to the holy mountain. He says, I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. He says, the burnt offering, their burnt offering, their sacrifices will I accept on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So God said, Listen, I, I want my house to be known as a house of prayer where people can come and experience me, join themselves to me, be my servants, and I'm going to be their God. I'm going to give them joy when they come into my house. But that's not what Jesus walked into. He walked into cows mooing and, 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 and sheep baying. And, and I don't know what kind of, I do know what kind of sound the doves make, but it's kind of hard to imitate that sound, ain't it? It's a, it's a hard sound. The third thing that God wants us to do is God desires that we stand on the authority of his word. So God desires that we stand on the authority of his word. Matter of fact, when Jesus had done these things, he made that whip and he started whipping out cattle. And he started whipping out sheep and he started telling them to get all the doves out. And he started taking the money changes and dumping them out on the floor and flipping over tables in the temple. It says some people came to him and they asked him some questions. Like Jews answered and said uh, to, to him, what sign, what sign do you show us since you do these things? And I want us to know that God is God's word doesn't take a back seat to science. So anytime we do anything for God, God wants us to stand on the authority of his word. What do we find in Jesus in Matthew chapter four? I believe it is where Jesus was taken up to the mountain to be tempted of the devil. It says the devil took him up there. First thing he pointed at Jesus was a stone after Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And he says, if you're the son of God, I want you to command this stone be made bread. And what was Jesus response? It is what? It's written. He said, then the devil took him up to pinnacle of the temple, said, throw yourself off. God will give his angels charge concerning you. And Jesus said, oh, it's written. You don't tempt the Lord your God. The devil took him to another place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Said, hey, listen, all these things I'll give you if you'll bow down and worship me. And Jesus says, listen, this is what the word of God says. You should worship God and only and him only self you serve. And so what God really wants us to know is even when the world today wants to see a sign from us as Christians, like it ain't good enough because the authority of God's word, it, it stops at us. Like if we go to the world and we say, hey, listen, this is what I believe because the Bible says so. In a lot of cases, a person that you're telling that to doesn't believe what the Bible says. So they want you to show them something. But even if you show them something, it doesn't and overtake the power of God's word. So God wants us to stand on his word regardless of what the world does. Verse, next verse says this, verse 19. It says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, uh, if you destroy this temple, I will, in three days, I will raise it up again. Next verse says, and the Jews said, it's, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. It says, will you raise it up in three days? So basically what they were literally looking at that there had been Solomon's temple, which was awesome and magnificent in itself. Then there was a guy named Herod that came behind him 
that lived actually started to reign 20 years before Jesus was born. And he built all this extra stuff around Solomon's temple, like multiple levels, balconies, like it was incredible. 46 years worth of building that they'd done. And they were looking at all this big old stone work. I mean, these stones are humongous that they would move around. And, and they're thinking that Jesus is going to destroy the temple that they're looking at. But Jesus is not talking about the, that temple. But Jesus is speaking of, verse 21, the temple of his body. And he says, therefore, when he had risen, just John fast forwards in verse 22, and he looks at Jesus' death. And when Jesus died, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them these things. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus said. The final thing that we want to see here that God wants us to get and grasp from this, this whole passage is God's desire is that we remember the, the promises of the Passover, that we remember the promises of the Passover. So in, in, in John chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, that many believed on his name and they saw signs which he did. And this word Passover is another word that we get today is for East Easter. And it goes all the way back to Exodus, where Exodus chapter 12, where we see the plagues are happening. And, and God gives the, the children of Israel specific direction. He says, I'm going to tell Moses, I'm going to cause 10 plagues to come on Pharaoh. And the 10th plague is going to be one that every single person is going to be involved with. You know, God had sent flies and he sent frogs and he sent lights, he sent all this stuff and none of that affected God's people but everything affected Pharaoh and his people but with this final plague it was going to be the, it was going to be death that would come on to the family so God tells him listen I want every family you to take a lamb and I want you to kill the lamb and I want you to take its blood and I want you to put its blood in a basin and I want you to take hyssop and you dip that, that, that hyssop or this leaf in the blood and you're going to use it as a paintbrush and I want you to mark the sides of the door and the top of the door with this blood and when the death angel comes to destroy the firstborn of every family he says I'm going to cause the death angel to see your blood and he's going to pass over you so ever since that moment they took this time to celebrate what God done with this mighty deliverance of bringing millions of people out of bondage overnight and this is what Jesus is there to do in the temple and we see the promises the promises are listed here in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Therefore say unto the children, I am the Lord, I will bring you out. Everybody repeat after me, I will bring you out. And he goes on to say, from under the, under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rescue you. Would you please say that I will rescue you? From their bondage, he says, I will redeem you. Would you say that with me? I will redeem you. With outstretched arms and great judgments. And verse 7 says, and I will take you as my people. Will you say that? I will. Very good. And it says, I will be your God. And then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And, and he, he goes on to give them these four basic promises that we find. So there's four basic cups that they would celebrate during this time of Passover. There was a Passover feast and there were four cups that they would celebrate in remembrance of what God had done to bring them out of bondage. The first cup that they would celebrate would be the cup of sanctification. This cup of sanctification, it's also known as the cup of salvation. It means to be holy and set apart. It means to be made holy through the blood of Jesus. That's what we believe today. And so it kind of transitions to Jesus now being that sacrificial lamb that goes to the cross and shed his blood on the cross. And what do we do here in America? We don't celebrate the Passover, but we do some, celebrate something that starts with an E that, that, that really reminds us every single, every single year that Jesus died on the cross for us. And that is called what? Easter. We celebrate Easter. So it's a cup of salvation. So it's through Jesus that we find salvation. I love it because every single animal or pet or whatever it is that I've saved over the years, when I saved that animal, that animal had no idea that it even needed saving. I mean, like so oftentimes our heart would fall and heart would sink as I'm driving down the highway and I see a little bitty puppy out there. Maybe he's five or six months old, like little bitty. And cars are whistling by on the highway. And he's just sitting looking like, like not even knowing like he's in the middle of harm's way, you know, and I'm one of these people like, so somebody come get that dog, you know, to 
chew them up like he didn't even know it needs saving. And so it is with us that God looked down at humanity and said, who humanity is in this trap of sin. And as sin is whistling by, and like we're sitting and looking all goofy, but he sends his son. His son dies on the cross for us. He picks us up. He takes us out of the highway of destruction to give us life and life more, more eternally. And, and, like, and I, I love this because what we do here at Life Church, we celebrate this first cup every Sunday. So every Sunday, we have an opportunity to experience the first cup, and we call that altar call. It's a time of celebration, a time of salvation right here every Sunday that we do this first cup. We do this first cup, and we call it the altar call, and that's how we give people an opportunity to be saved here at Life Church. It's through Sunday services. Next cup, he it's a cup of deliverance, a cup of deliverance. There's a cup of deliverance. It's also called a cup of freedom. And basically what God's saying, listen, I don't, I don't, it's, it's one thing for you to be out of the prison that you've been in. Like I was looking at some of the Egyptian artwork, you know, and some of the, you know, it talks, I was, man, it was 2 Samuel and 1 Samuel, awesome. Like it's talking about David and him fighting Goliath and Goliath's sons, like it's, all these giants were in the land. So I started Googling, saw these giant people, and they, they etched their images in stone. Like, so the normal giant would be standing here, and then a the person that was six foot or five foot something tall would be standing right here next to him, like there were real giants in the land. It was talking about this one guy, giant that was so strong, he had a spear, and said this, the end of his spear weighed like 300 pounds. Like, he was, yeah, that's got to be a pretty strong dude. I don't care who you are, man. You got a spear with a head on it. That's 300 pounds. You're a hoss. I mean, especially like to jug somebody like that is pretty strong. So I start Googling that. And it's in this cup of deliverance that God is talking about is that the children of Israel, they were in bondage and they were in such horrible condition that they show them in all those images. They got something that looks like a big elephant ear and it's on a pole and like they're fan these Egyptian like giant kings and like under no way of circumstance could they get out of that situation but God delivers them from that thing, that bondage of that lifestyle of bondage and I don't know about you but even though they were free from that bondage and they moved with Moses and they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground there was something still inside of them way through. they thought like a slave and what God wants us to know is when he takes us out of that old lifestyle he takes us into something new he doesn't want us to continue to think like a failure he wants us to believe and start to apply our faith and he wants to change everything on the inside of us to, to make all things new. I'm sorry for preaching so long, but it says that God says, I'm going to rescue you from that bondage. And this word, the second cup is this cup of where he's going to rescue, he's going to deliver, he's going to, uh, going to change you and bring, take you out of the world. He's going to He's going to do a thing inside of you that he's going to change your habits, he's going to change your behaviors, he's going to change your your uh lifestyle. I had one of my brothers say, hey man, I, I'm, I'm around a wrong crowd here where I'm at. You know, I'm, I'm in Oklahoma City, but man, if I can move up to Missouri with you, I think I'll, I think I'll have, a, have a better chance of like staying off of drugs and staying away from drinking and staying away from, and I said, yeah, you, you would have a ch better chance, but I'm going to tell you something like, even if you save and you move to a different place, where you got to get to is you got to like allow God to change all those habits and all those behaviors and all those appetites on the inside of you. If you allow God to do that work on the inside of you so you're not tempted to go back to that old lifestyle, baby, you're going to make it. But if you come to Missouri, I guarantee you it's people that's using drugs, it's people that's doing alcohol. Everything that you see in Oklahoma City is happening here. It may not be in bigger scale, but it's going to happen right here. But you got to ask God to change me on the inside. Everybody say, God, change me on the inside. We got to have an inside change. The third cup that we see that they celebrated as promise of Passover was this cup of redemption. This cup of redemption. He says, I'm going to rescue you from being in bondage. He says, I'm going to redeem you with an outstretched arm. He says, God said, listen, I'm going to take you from being slaves. I'm going to change you on the inside. And then the next thing he says, I'm going to redeem you. So this cup of redemption represents that, that God is going to take us back to original specification and original design. I don't know how many 
babies that were born into being slaves that were down with the Egyptians, but that's not God's original intent for them. It didn't mean for them to live their whole life and being slaves, but it, this redemption is God calling us to our purpose and the calling and the destiny that he has for us. It's called redemption. Like, what has God created us to do? So, for us here at Life Church, when we when we say that God is God is going to bring cause us to have freedom, we do that through small groups. We know that in order for people to truly find freedom, you got to get in a place where you can talk through and have somebody coach you through and get get over those the the, the hangups of the past and go into God's word with you. So, for redemption, what we do here at Life Church is we do something called growth tracks to help you discover what your purpose is. What is the purpose that God created you for? And then what's your personality? And what are the spiritual gifts that God has for you? The final of the fourth cups is this cup of praise. It's called Hallel. Everybody say Hallel. And it's the first part of the word Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallel. And it's found here. It says, God, I'm, I'm going to take you to be my own people, even me in my lifetime, there's nothing that I could ever experience that's like the presence of God where God has taken me and his presence has gone with me and I can sense and feel uh, God's presence. But it's the cup of Hallel or the cup of praise that God gives us. It's a time of celebration. It's uh, uh, living a life with praise. It's living a life really in response to those first three cups. And what God wants us to know and see and do is to understand that any time that we can, that we truly find fulfillment is when we're serving God with God, like we're allowing God to lead us every day. We're praying and pursuing God. And when we do that, then God gives us specific instructions and we feel like we feel fulfilled because God's presence is with us. And that's that cup of praise. So here, Jesus, he finally concludes uh his visit to the temple and he's he's looking around at everybody that's in the temple and he says uh, a couple things here says that Jesus didn't commit himself to any of them because he knew all men everybody say Jesus knew all men so with Jesus it wasn't like somebody needed to come up and tell our story I didn't have to Jesus but Jesus walked in the room I wouldn't have to tell him my mom's name was Dorothy my dad's name was Jack my oldest was brother's name was Michael. My, like he knew everything about me. He knew it. I didn't have to tell him my football coach's name if he walked in the room. Like Jesus knew all people. He knew everything about everybody. And when the Jews were coming to him and they were saying, listen, we want you to show us some signs to show us that you're truly the person that's able to do what you've just done, which is trying to make things new in the temple. Who do you think you are? He knew all men. Matter of fact, not only did he know them, but it goes on to say in verse 25, that he had, they, they, and, and Jesus had no need for anyone should testify a man for he knew what was in man. Like, not only did he know people, but he knew everything about us. He knew every person's strengths. He knew every person's weaknesses. He knew every person's tendencies. He, there's a woman named Mary Magdalene, says, out of whom came seven devils. Like, Jesus knew what was inside of every person, every spirit of rejection and fear and heaviness and disappointment and shame and depression and anxiety and stress. Jesus could walk on the scene. He, he would know what your struggles were. And so Jesus, in this chapter, he teaches us like the first miracles on the miracle of turning water into wine and how Jesus can take our situation. He can turn our situation around. We see Jesus talking and transforming the temple and causing things to be made new in the temple. And matter of fact, in each one of our lives, it, if we were honest with ourselves, there's some things going on in our we need Jesus to we need Jesus to to transform and to make new or some things that Jesus needs to come into our heart, soul, mind, and strength with his whip that he he made and chased some things off that's been that's been keeping us up at nighttime and waking us up in the middle of the night with night sweats and stress and uh, anxiety and fear and all those different things that have been weighing heavy on our hearts and you have to know that you're God's temple and God wants to dwell with you and dwell in you and he sent Jesus to, to be that person for you so hopefully this is something said today it calls you to think about the promises that God's given us through the Passover through Easter we don't look at Easter as being a season where you know, we just think of like just the salvation piece of it and we leave it at salvation. But God wants to change all those things on the inside of us. 
God wants to redeem us. God wants to show us the purpose that he's created us for. God wants us to find a true life of fulfillment and praise by us recognizing his presence and experiencing his presence all the days of our life. So let's stand to our feet and I'm going to pray for you. And I want you to leave this place transformed. And I've, I've prayed specifically that God's presence and power would show up in a mighty way. Now that you would experience him in great imagine that he would give you, give you all the things that, that you need, even those things you don't even know that you need them. But, you, but you're here today, and some of us, we're in a season of uh, <clears throat> our marriage is going good and saved, but our marriage is not everything that it needs to be. We need those other three cups operating in our life. Maybe it's our faith walk where we are saved, but maybe we got a relationship with God that's more business-like instead of us being uh, truly uh, in love and in relationship with the Father, we kind of treat God like a professional relationship, you know. And in Las Vegas at nighttime, they got some people out there that have professional loving relationships that you can pay for, right? You wanna, you wanna be loved, you just go get somebody some money. They're gonna love you for a moment. But God wants us to know that he desires to be in personal, intimate relationship with us, that it goes beyond a moment, that every single day of our life that we're living our life for him. So we want you to truly experience God in a great way. Maybe it's your finances. Uh, maybe it's something going on with your family, but God's here for you. And God's going to bless you right now if you just open your heart up, whatever the thing is that you're believing him for. This is your moment. This is your time. This is your season. So we want to pray for the greatest miracle of all, which is a miracle of salvation. That's that first cup, the cup of sanctification, and God's going to transform your life and make all things new. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, what I want you to do right now, right now it's just to search yourself say hey listen have i ever in my life just to be the lord of my life and so that I know that today is the day that god's going to do it for you the cup of salvation the cup of sanctification is right here for you that that is not just a cup but it's the sacrifice that jesus himself made on the cross for me and you that we can be in relationship with the father so with every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna want you to examine yourself. And if you've never done that, it's really simple. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand on the count of three and then we're gonna pray a prayer together. And God's gonna transform your life and make all things new for you. So one, two, three. If you just raise your hand, we're gonna pray together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're gonna pray together. See anyone else here that you know that you never said yes to Jesus and you want to do that you want to do that that Jesus died for you to be in relationship with God and that's what this is all about it's this cup of salvation that Jesus died on the cross for you let's pray this prayer together dear Lord Jesus thank you for dying for me thank you for shedding your blood for me today I make all things new through you I give you my life. Transform me in every way. Amen and amen. I want to pray for the rest of uh, those in the room that you're saying, hey, Pastor Bobby, I'm, I'm good on my relationship with Jesus. I, I, uh, I come to church and I study the word, I pray, and I worship every day. Uh, but my entire life is not everything that it needs to be. And... Uh, I want my whole life to be transformed. I want my faith walk. I want my marriage. I want my family. I want my finances. I want my career. I want God just to bless me in every capacity. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's anybody in this room, uh, you, you know you need God to do some greater works in your life. And you're willing to give him an opportunity to do those things in your life. I, want you at this time on the count of three I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and we want to just ask God's blessing on you he would touch your heart soul mind and strength and cause those things to be made new in your life one two three if you could just please raise your hands I'm going to pray for you I'm going to pray for you thank you so much I'm praying for you right now so father in the mighty mighty name of Jesus I'm praying for every person whose hand went up all over the room and even those that heart their hearts went up like it's just something inside of him that's just leaped. Um, when I said marriage, I 
leap when I said finance, a leap when I said, you know, I didn't even say addiction. Or, but God, there's so many things that could be operating against us. So many weapons that the enemy could bring our direction. But Father, we stand on your word and your goodness prevails. So God, you're able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us in the church by and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm asking now that that word would be released into our hearts. God, every single person's heart, soul, mind, and strength will be transformed. God, every anxiety, every stress, every worry, every fear, every panic, that you would break those things off of your people. God, everything that the enemy's doing to cause us to get off focus and get off track, even you watching online, this moment is for you that God is touching you and moving through the airways to come into that place where you're at now and that you could experience him in greater measure. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I cancel every assignment of the enemy off of the health of your people. Like those who've gotten bad reports from doctors, in the name of Jesus, it's by Jesus' stripes that you heal. God, the enemy's at work against marriages. So in the name of Jesus, we cancel the enemy's assignment off of marriages in the name of Jesus. God, the enemy's after our faith walk with you and our relationship with you. We thank you, God, that we lay our heart, soul, mind, and strength on your altar. And we just pray that the blood of Jesus would transform us in every way. On the inside out, would you do a freedom work now, the yoke that destroys uh, the anointing that destroys every yoke in the name of Jesus. God bless your people's finances in the name of Jesus. God bless families in Jesus' name. We call this church full. We call this church blessed. We call these families in to you. God, we thank you that we have the authority and power to cancel every assignment of the enemy off of the families that are represented here and those that are watching online. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus, we release your name, your power, your authority, your dominion against the work of the enemy against our families in Jesus' name. So, Father, I bless these, your people, and I do thank you for what you're doing to bring them total and complete peace and fulfillment. That this is your house, and we do call your house the house of prayer. And, God, we lift up every concern. God, I'm even praying for the things that I didn't mention. Someone's here said, hey, you didn't, you didn't say anything about this problem that I'm facing. Don't have to father i just pray in the name of jesus you're searching hearts and minds at this moment you're searching hearts and minds that you would hear their hearts cry you would search every mind and that you would bring deliverance and freedom in every of their life in the name of jesus we thank you god that you're a good god and you know all that we stand in need of in the mighty mighty name of jesus we do praise you and give you thanks for your goodness and grace and mercy. Now, Father, I pray for those who are traveling or on vacation, who are here, there, and yonder, and um, some are set to lake this weekend, whatever they're doing, Father, I just praise you and thank you for keeping your people and drawing them back to yourself. Protect them as they travel, uh, as they uh, do things with their families, that you would, you would keep them safe in those activities. Oh, it's vacation season. In the name of Jesus, we Thank you for your goodness that you extended to Life Church and all the wonderful blessings that you poured out on us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated.